I'm Sean Studer. I'm the head of medical affairs for the U.S. Pulmonary Hypertension Group. Uh, medical affairs is largely responsible, as many people know, for post-approval research reviews, um, expanding the knowledge about medications that Johnson & Johnson already has in its FDA-approved portfolio, as well as managing some safety and other pieces. Um, the interesting part for many is, is to know that I actually came to J&J &J as my first industry role about three and a half years ago. Prior to that time, I was a practicing clinician um, taking care of patients with pulmonary hypertension. So I have a passion in this that goes all the way back to my initial specialty training in lung diseases um, and really persists all the way through my present role, which you know, I'm very happy to be with, with J&J &J in now. PAH, which is pulmonary arterial hypertension, right, is a rare, progressive, and unfortunately fatal illness in many. Um, the exact cause is not known in the majority. We know some associations, for example, some folks with what we consider connective tissue diseases like systemic sclerosis are at higher risk of getting pulmonary arterial hypertension. But the majority of cases that are enrolled in clinical trials, and we believe then reflects how it actually exists out there, are actually sporadic cases, or what we term idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. We don't know exactly where it comes from. There's also some genetic associations, but this illness really is, is centered, many people believe, on the pulmonary, the small pulmonary arterioles. Basically, the blood flows out of the heart through the pulmonary artery. Those vessels get smaller and smaller until you actually get to the air sacs in the lung where the air is exchanged. And it's right near that junction between the very small pulmonary arterioles and the capillaries that some scarring, some narrowing occurs. Um, and again, it's progressive in most individuals. So the goal largely with therapies have been to slow that progression. The aim is ultimately to get something that stops it, but the, the illness is unfortunately short of that type of curative treatment approach right now. So early on, it's tough to say that there's any singular or really clear red flag, right? One of the things that when I was educating in the space in the past, and many of uh, physician healthcare provider colleagues are now educating, is that if there's an initial diagnosis placed, let's say it's a young woman, we'll say for sake of argument, she's in her 40s and has shortness of breath and fatigue that's not well explained, can't put their finger on it, if the initial treatment or guidance approaches is thought to be something else, arguably something more common, maybe exercise-induced asthma, they're often thought to be out of shape. Sometimes they're expected to be exhausted because their responsibilities go up. They're now managing a family. If those things seem to be inadequate in the explanation over time, meaning over months, the symptoms are progressing or not responding to initial treatments, that's sort of a small flag. It's not always picked up on in months. Often the flags that come up are for more advanced disease. So examples I've heard of in, in, in patients in practice, they present having passed out and there's no known heart disease that would be a reason they would suddenly pass out. It wasn't an excessively hot day. They weren't doing anything that should have given a reason or cause for concern. Chest pain comes late in the disease, but when someone's complaining of chest pain, that's almost always a red flag for heart disease. Again, I want to clarify that those, quote, red flags or clearer signs are later stage findings in someone with pulmonary hypertension. They may have had symptoms for one to two years, maybe more, before those things present. So it is tougher early on to look for this. Now, usually when someone goes through a comprehensive evaluation, it's eventually found, but it can be a lot of referral between different specialists, right? The primary care doc wants to do the right thing, sends them to the cardiologist. They may not see signs of pulmonary arterial hypertension. They may send them to a pulmonologist, lung specialist. They may say, well, it's not a clear cut lung disease, which if you look at the air spaces in the lung, like emphysema, asthma, it's not that. And so it can be a bit of back and forth in time before they get there. Because the flags, as we referred to, are somewhat nonspecific early, and it takes to later disease for them to be more clearly heart-related. So it's been evolving, as you'd imagine, since the first treatments came out in the 1990s. Um, it takes a while to get them diagnosed. Unfortunately, in many cases, it's not unusual for patients to go two years or more from symptom onset to diagnosis. And I think part of the challenge with that really is when you look at how the disease presents, what do people first experience when they start? And it's the fact that they have shortness of breath and fatigue. And so those are very nonspecific symptoms, tend to take a little bit of time to figure this out. Now, the approach has been initially to start treatments, assess how they're doing and to add them on. But in 2022, the European Society of Cardiology, European Respiratory Society actually recommended for the majority of patients that is those, they put the caveat, that don't have other heart and lung cardiopulmonary abnormalities to start an upfront combination. 
And so the typical start treatment is with two therapies, typically something in what's called the PDE5 inhibitor pathway and the endothelin receptor antagonist pathway. So those two are often given up front as an initial combination approach. And then reassessment should occur no more than three to six months later, according to those guidelines. And if the patient is not improving or achieving what in the guidelines is called a low risk status, low risk for worsening or mortality, they should either stay at that if they're low risk or have continued consideration for further therapy based on that. So Opsinvi is a combination of masitentin, one of those endothelin receptor antagonists, that's the pathway that acts in, and tadalafil in this phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitor pathway. And so those have been used in combination and were recommended as a high-level evidence-based recommendation by these European guidelines that were published in 2022. Opsinvi tried to look at it as how would it be as a combination therapy? So it's often abbreviated as M slash T, mastentin to dalafil therapy, single tablet combination therapy, or STCT, for patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. And one of the reasons we are excited about the approval that was announced by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration on March 22nd was that there was often a gap between this recommended upfront dual combination, or at least early sequential, if they don't start on exactly the same day, within a fairly short period of time, they got on two of those foundational pathway treatments, and what was actually being seen in practice, meaning patients were often persisting on a single therapy. And there may be clinician decision and patient reasons why that's appropriate, but the size of the population that continued six months or more on a single therapy suggested there was an opportunity to get closer to the guidelines. And we think Opsinvi is one of these decisions that clinicians can discuss with their patients as an opportunity to close that gap, if you will. Get patients' actual treatment closer to guideline-based or guideline-recommended upfront early combination therapy. If we go back to the 1990s, there was really only infusion therapy, effective but very challenging for patients. The original versions of this uh, medication generically referred to as epoprostenol. They often had to have a catheter or a tube into their, their vein continuously, a pump, delivering the medication all day long. Left risk for infection from the delivery system, challenges with the dosing. It was not an easy medication to administer. Um, and the side effects, the fact that it was continually up titrated or upped in dose, made it challenging. When the first oral therapies came out in the early 2000s, the goal then was to start a therapy. If they were very sick, probably still that infusion. If they were not quite as sick, maybe the oral tablet. And then to sequentially add on based on how the patient was doing. The challenges the field recognized is that patients would often get initial improvement. Things would go up from the initial treatment, which was great, but it wasn't sustained for a very long period of time. And they may not always reached a place where their functioning was what they, what they wanted to achieve. This is a disease I should clarify is, is predominantly in women. Most of the trials in this space, about 80% women. And although it's seen across the age ranges from newborn into older adults, it tends to peak in the 40s and 50s. So we're not talking about individuals who were slowing down in their activity. Many of them were very robust, had a lot of responsibilities, work, family, and so on. And this illness was really limiting their ability to be that functional. So the monotherapy or start one and see how they do approach just wasn't getting a lot of patients to where they needed to be. And our concern for this disease, and we often refer to as, as, as progressive and fatal, is that when you lose functioning, it's tough to get it all back. Many patients will get better when a new therapy is added, but not necessarily as well as they were when the deter before the deterioration started. So this idea of progressing towards a routine combination therapy approach had been a while in the making, but it's based on that evidence that two medications up front tend to get them to a better place initially, and ideally help that be sustained for a bit. Now, again, two medications isn't everyone's approach, but it's the right start the field has recommended to believe per the guidelines compared to an initial monotherapy and then seeing how it goes. Well, what I would wanna say about the, the illness space is we've been working as one of the leaders in pulmonary hypertension for years. In fact, over 60,000 patients have been touched by Johnson & Johnson pulmonary arterial hypertension medications. We've been doing everything we can to try to promote earlier diagnosis. That's been partnering with advocacy societies. That's been partnering with initiatives and research to try to look for earlier markers. And we're very proud of that legacy and, and that foray into this. Our real hope with the advent of something like Opsinvi is when the diagnosis gets made, we can close one of the other important time gaps, which is time to go from initial diagnosis 
two guideline recommended treatment, which is this dual combination. And we think perhaps the single fill in the prescription, reducing the complexity of having multiple medications to obtain may help patients get on that guideline-based therapy earlier on and hopefully put them on a better path than if there's further delays in what might be their optimal treatment.